Well, hello, hello, my lovelies. Welcome to another episode of Ginger Archie. I am your hostess with the mostess. I just added that and it sounds really bad, so I'm never going to do that again. Um, Trisha Stewart, man. <laughs> Sometimes I try things. I'm back with video. It's been a while. Um, unless it's been on the main show, I have not done video in a while, but I feel like my hair is fabulous. So I'm going to do that today. Um, I have an awesome guest. I think you guys are going to learn a lot. And I think people are going to be particularly interested as of what has happened over the last couple of days. Um, I have Sterling Luhan. Please tell me I pronounced that correctly. Perfectly. <laughs> okay. Well, we've been friends on Facebook and have talked here and there, but I, actually sometimes you realize if you haven't met somebody in person, you could totally butcher their name. So I'm glad I didn't do that. So uh, Sterling has a book that's coming out uh, soon, and we'll link all of that later. He is an anarchist, and I know some of you listening are just libertarians, um, maybe conservatives, Democrats, whatever, on the political spectrum. And so I might be the only anarchist you know, which is really sad, so you should meet some more. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm excited about this book, but what else Sterling does is he is... Um, a crypto journalist. So a lot of you might be interested in cryptocurrency and maybe you know a lot more than I do about it, but we're going to learn a little bit about that today. So I really like your bio, Sterling, because I'd never heard this before. You are a psychologic anarchist. Okay, we'll go into that. <laughs> and a communications ambassador of Bitcoin.com. Sterling travels the world speaking at Liberty and Crypto conferences. Sterling conducts keynote speeches, moderates and speaks on panels, and consults businesses and entrepreneurs in the crypto and libertarian space. So welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a, a minor correction there. I'm actually the former communication ambassador for Bitcoin.com. Currently, I am the, the chief compliance officer for CryptoSpace, which is a cryptocurrency exchange out of L.A., and I am also a senior partner in a firm called Cyclic Media. We're a high-tech, uh, med-tech, fintech. Uh, growth and advisory agency. So I didn't dig deep enough when I was looking. <laughs> <laughs> I probably okay, need to well, update my, my material. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Usually I ask for one, but I'm like, he's all over the internet. I can find it. Um, so that's cool. So you are still a crypto journalist then? Yeah, I do do some of that still. I do crypto writing, but I'm, I'm more uh, in the managerial piece of it now, uh, helping manage companies' risk and those kind of things in the crypto space. Okay. But um, yeah, I still write. <laughs> So we want to, we're going to circle back to that because I have a lot of questions just personally about that as well. But I want to talk about your book coming out and anarchy obviously is a topic that um, is close to my heart. And a lot of people um, listening might be like, oh, the people that kick over trash cans. And so <laughs> I can see from what you forwarded me a little bit of that first essay, you're trying to dispel that. Um, and so is, it's a, is it a book of essays? Yeah, it's kind of, it's a collected works, really a heavily edited collected works based on material that I've been writing about over the last decade, a little over a decade. So it does consist of some essays and some articles, uh, but there's also what used to be social media posts. Some of them were quite long that I, that actually my wife and I started to compile together back in 2016, 2017. So we've been working on this a, a long time, compiling the best material that I've written on social media. And one of the reasons that we started to do this early on was because we knew that that Facebook and other social media sites are, uh, for one, they're a really big fan of censorship and removing anarchist material from the interwebs. So I wanted to make sure we could collect all of my material together so people could have access to it in the event that I'm censored or squelched online. That was one of the major uh, driving forces. And that's only been, uh, you know, buttressed earlier by what Facebook and some of these other social media platforms have been doing to people, especially I, anarchists. I believe you were part of the 2018 purge of alternative yes, media. Yes, yeah. that is correct. My page, Psychologic Anarchist, I had about 50,000 people following that page and they, they, they killed it. Yep. I have a lot of friends who suffered from that and have never really come back in full as far as social media presence, but at We Are Libertarians Network, we're trying to kind of um, reach different spaces because I do think in a certain way, social media is a dying platform. Um, and it, part of me is sad about that. I mean, there's other spaces to go, um, but I think it's a good thing that you kept that information. I know there's places where you can actually record all your Facebook photos and pictures and things like that, you know, so you have it uploaded somewhere. Um, 
So you, you wrote this book, Dignity and Decency, Rhapsodic Musings of a Modern Anarchist. And I love that. I don't think there's a lot of anarchist philosophers anymore. There are a lot that think they are. <laughs> um, and so, you, you know, you used to be able to just go pick up a book and read, you know, essays on anarchism or whatever. And I just don't feel like we have a lot of those people in that space anymore. So I'm excited to read that. But what, how did you come to be being an anarchist, uh, what was your story to get there? I mean, did, were you born one or was it something that you became <laughs> later in life? <laughs> I guess there's an argument that any one of us could make that we're all born anarchists, kind of like we're all born atheists, right? We're not born with this idea of God in our heads. That's something that's uh, typically indoctrinated or put into our heads by other people. Same thing with anarchism. But Notwithstanding that fact, I started to come into the philosophy through this path that I took in life, and I'll tell you this in a stepwise process. The first thing that happened to me was I, I was in my mid-20s. I was not a thinking person. I was kind of just going through the motions of life, right? The whole, you know, your parents tell you go to school, uh, get a job, save money, uh, live your life abiding by the rules and the laws as they're set, set in stone by society. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Be an automaton. <laughs> effectively. What happened is so, somewhere when I when I was 25 years old, someone that was really close to me uh, told me to come over to their house and they wanted to show me something. They wanted to introduce me to something. And this thing they wanted to introduce me to was a little pill called MDMA. Uh, this, now, nowadays, kids refer to it as, as Molly, right? It used to be called ecstasy. MDMA just stands for methylene, doxy, methamphetamine. It's a so the, the technical term is it's an intactogen and a pathogen. It invokes, uh, heightens our empathy response and uh, adds a, a, more, a stronger sense of uh, tactile sensations, right? I took this pill and it absolutely woke me up. It burst, it, it, I burst open from this uh, cocoon of non-existence and non-thought. Suddenly, I started to question everything, and that's when I started to peek on the drug. I was I was touching myself. My eyes were rolling in the back of my head, and I was like, holy shit, this is profound. So not only did I have these bodily sensations, but my mind, for the first time, it felt like it started to work. It, it, and I remember at the peak of the experience, I had what the, the Buddhists call – a satori moment like a flash of insight and then i started repeating this mantra to myself i, I started to say that uh, i'm smarter than anyone that's ever told me that i am i'm a lot smarter than anybody has ever told me that i am and i kept repeating this to myself and then i had a, a flashback on my you know growing up and and going to school and being put in remedial math classes i was like rediscovering my trauma it was this all this stuff was happening simultaneously in my head. And then on the come down of the experience, I thought I'm no longer going to live the way that I've been living. So I experienced a quantum personality shift. I changed in the moment. Suddenly I wanted to read books, uh, not just for the purposes of escaping reality, but for actually wanting to learn more. I decided I wanted to study psychology because now all of a sudden I'm super interested in the mind and the brain and the mind brain connection. So I got hardcore into that, I actually went back to school and got my uh, degree in psychology. I got a bachelor's degree in psychology. And then I started to, to I, I want to help people now. So I went and started uh, my master's degree. And I didn't, I didn't finish that. That's another part of the story and we'll get to it. But the whole idea here is that this woke me up. And one of the main things that I started to question was the status quo, right? The common narrative. I took this pill and I, I remember being told that these drugs will ruin your life. They'll destroy your life. They're no good for you. But this had the opposite effect. It woke me up and I realized I want to do more with my life. And then I started asking, why is this drug banned? If this woke me up, the potential is there. That this can do this for anybody in society. There's a lot of potential there to help people in various ways, not only to combat their trauma, but also to snap them out of the stupor and lackadaisical lifestyle that they've been living. And that's what happened to me. So I became impassioned about spreading this compound to as many people as possible. And that's absolutely what I did. I, I bought a bunch of MDMA and I, to use the colloquial term, I became a drug dealer. I started selling MDMA to all kinds of people. Well, so are most pharmacists. Of them are my friends. <laughs> <laughs> that, yes, that's right. A absolutely. What happened next is interesting because I started selling drugs to so many people, MDMA specifically, because I was wanting to help wake them up and it became you know, profitable as well. So I was active on the market. Uh, what ended up 
inevitably happening was a, a buddy of mine who was involved in my drug deals sold some cocaine and some MDMA to an undercover narcotics agent. And then my the unfortunate circumstance after that is the cops got a warrant for my house and my little house, my door was kicked in and I was raided by the state police and by uh, various agents of the state and local police in the town that I was in. And it was a very, it was not a fun experience. A gun put to my head, I was thrown to the ground. The, the cops effectively feigned that they were part of the workers for that, for some kind of air conditioning company or something. So it was a subterfuge. And then I was kidnapped and thrown into a cage. I was held for bond at, what was it? I think it was $10,000 is what I had to pay to get out of jail. Uh, luckily, my family was able to help out with that. And then I was put on probation. I ended up getting put on probation, deferred adjudication for 10 years. I, I, they actually had threatened me with prison time, but luckily it was a smaller town than I, that I lived in. So I was able to get one of the smarmiest, uh, closest attorneys that I could. This attorney was connected with the, the DA in the town, and they were able to wrangle a deal since I was a first-time offender to get me out on deferred adjudication probation. But get this, it took a year for me to actually, because of the because of the drug war, all the courts are always overfilled. So it took a year mm -hmm. for me to even go uh, to trial for this. And uh, this is where major changes happened in my life. I'd already woken up to, uh, to the idea that something was wrong in society on a fundamental level as a result of the MDMA. Well, all this did was, was expedite my movement or my change into an anarchist because now I had a year to ponder what had happened to me. And during this period, my family, my parents, my friends, everybody begrudged me for doing what I did and, and made me out like I was a bad guy. I was just consensually trading drugs in a market environment to people who wanted it. It's not like I was on the kindergarten playground and handing drugs to children, right? These were all grown consenting adults. So I asked the question a lot, what did I actually do wrong besides help people wake up, right? Besides facilitate an altered state of consciousness in other people's minds. I didn't do anything to hurt anybody, so why didn't men with guns come to my house and kidnap me and take me to a cage? So at this point, I started reading uh, a lot more books on these uh, political subjects, and I inevitably this was this was around 2009, by the way, and this was so it was during the Ron Paul mm -hmm. revolution, and so I started following Ron Paul. I was like this guy's against the drug war. This guy knows what he's talking about. This is so I read his book in the Fed and then he had another one called The Revolution of Manifesto. I read that book. And in these books he referenced somebody very important to my intellectual growth is a Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard wrote a book called For a New Liberty. And I read this book and now all the ideas in my that I'd already had in my head, not only the ideas I had, but the way that I was living were consolidated in philosophical fashion. I read this book and I was like, yeah, this guy knows exactly what he's talking about. I remember it clear as day, chapter three called The State outlined the idea that the that government or the state is just basically a group of parasites who use who have a monopoly on force over a large territorial region. Right. And so they're just rulers in a given area. It's like, yep, that's what I knew all along. That's that's it. So this helped me gain a clear, a concise, and consolidated understanding of the nature of the state, how it functions, because it had happened to me directly. I had, I had a direct experience with the system and how it functions and how messed up it is. I it was in a good position because I was a first-time offender, but I also had the ability to articulate these ideas. So I started doing that. As soon as this happened, I started getting uh, talking about these ideas on Facebook, on social media. This was early days of Facebook, right? Back in 2009, 2010. And I've been talking about these ideas ever since. But that's effectively how I became an anarchist. It wasn't just reading books. It was an admixture of everything that had happened to me experientially as well. Because by my nature, I want to live as freely as possible. And that's what I was doing with MDMA. I was helping people wake up and realize there's more to life than just playing video games or just going to your nine to five job for workaday drudgery. There's a lot more to life than that. And there's ways that we want to experience, our spirits want to experience freedom. So that's what I was pushing for. And uh, inevitably I collided with the state in that process. So that's kind of a long story, but that's the gist of it.
I like this story. It's unique. And for those of you, maybe newer libertarians or people that say, well, you know, you broke a law and did something bad because, quote, drugs are bad. Um, I would just say simply maybe read up a little bit on libertarian and anarchist philosophy because, you know, the Fugitive Slave Act was a law and it was very wrong. So um, anarchists don't consider the law and morality to be on the same level. Um, rarely do they cross. Occasionally they do. You know, murder is wrong. Um, so, <laughs> um, and as far as the drug war, I think most people listening would understand that that does nothing for anyone besides put innocent people in cages, innocent of hurting someone else. And, you know, if somebody really does have an actual drug issue where they have an addiction that leads them to do bad things, that type of an addiction, putting them in a cage doesn't solve any problems. It makes it worse. Um, so when you ran up against the state, I know a lot of anarchists and libertarians, that's how they first come to it. It's not like I read this book and the lights went off. Um, so did you start like thinking, okay, I'm reading Rothbard, I'm a Rothbardian anarchist, or did you start like, well, you know, some government is good, or did you just go full blown like, oh, I don't need any government at all? Good, great, great question, Trish. So there was a very small window uh, where I was a minarchist, right? Uh, I, I want to say, you, you know, and there's this old saying too that goes, you know, the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist is six months. Six months. <laughs> right. Yeah. So or probably for about that amount of time, maybe a little less, I was a libertarian ever since I came. It was pretty much after I got arrested during that that year where I waited to go to trial, I had come across Ron Paul. And during that that time frame, I was a pretty, you know, a pretty solid minarchist. I had the understanding that government was bad from Ron Paul. I still Ron, thought Ron Paul could do good being in government to to provide more freedom for the individual. individual. So I'm still I, – I very much do love Ron Paul, and I think he was probably one of the best politicians as far as politicians come. But it wasn't until I read Murray Rothbard's book that I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't want any kind of government. And now that I know what, act, what government actually is, why would I want even a little snippet, even a, just a little bit? Of these guys who are effectively thugs and violent murderers and psychopaths, why would I want these guys in my life at all? So I immediately became, once I read his book, immediately became an anarcho-capitalist or what some refer to as a voluntarist. Mm -hmm. I just believe that all human interactions and relationships should be as voluntary and as consensual as humanly possible. And I think most people understand the precepts of consent, right? A lot of people in the political spectrum talk about the importance of consent as, as it's related to sex and other types of issues. So why can't we just apply that to our own relationship with the state? If we want our relationship to be consensual and, con and a consensual relationship is de facto a moral relationship, we can't really have any relationship to the state at all because everything they do is based in coercion, fraud, and violence. Um, a lot of people that maybe are newer to the ideas might say, well, you know, the old, not who will build the roads, but, you know, the state does some good things like, you know, you wouldn't have rules if there was anarchy and who would catch the murderers. And obviously you and I, you know, know the answers to that. Um, right. But I did read in your first, that first snippet of the essay was talking about it, anarchy means no rulers. It doesn't mean no rules. And I believe personally, and I know we can debate this as different types of anarchists, I suppose, or whatever, that there, I do believe in natural law. Um, but uh, I'm not sure where you stand on that. But what would you say to somebody that said, you know, who's going to lock bad people up or people will be evil without the state, those kind of arguments? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a, this is a tough argument. <laughs> Because the first, the first, there's hey. one problem that, that, that <laughs> there's one, there's one problem that comes with this particular argument that to the people who say, well, what about all the actual bad people, the murderers and the robbers? Well, the first, the first issue is this is circular, right? Because if your knee jerk reaction is to look at the, you know, having the state manage this, well, the people who run the state are actually thieves, and murderers, and the very people that you're talking about. So you have a logical problem out of the gate with advocating for the state to take care of these issues. So that's that's one problem. But to get more down to practical reality, I think there's a lot of ways we can handle these situations, and we've seen it done before. I, I like to reference Gaelic Ireland. Gaelic Ireland was effectively free. They had like a puppet ruler, right? They were effectively free for 2,000 years. And in Gaelic Ireland, they, 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 these guys had a private 
justice system that was managed by these private judges called Brehons. And with Brehon law, if you there was no such thing as a crime against the state. So that's a big issue. In modern society, there's always if the, a lot of the crimes that are that are shouldn't be crimes because they're consensual are crimes against the state. Mm -hmm. So in 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 Gaelic Ireland, Brehon law, uh, crime, there was no such thing as crime or criminality. There were only wrongs done against other individuals or perpetrated against other individuals. And these individuals or the tribes would settle these with these private Brehons. And the Brehons would figure out a way to work out, work it out so somebody gets paid or a, a wrong is righted and some victim is made whole, right? So, and these this worked out very well in the society because they had these, these insurances called sureties. And the sureties they, they actually used to build out this infrastructure for a society based on righting the wrongs that people do to each other rather than to the state. And this this lasted two thousand years, and yes, there were still fights. There were tri there was some kind of tribal warfare. There were skirmishes. It was by no means perfect, but it does speak to the idea that a free society can function based on private arbitration, or what we refer to as dispute arbitration. We don't need rulers, kings, thieves, kleptocrats, and these other individuals telling us how we should manage our affairs or how we should solve problems, we have the ability to work together to figure out how to solve those. And the, the modern term for this, of course, is uh, called a, a, a DRO or a dispute resolution organization or a private defense agency. You can create these kind of agencies and they work, can work based on the market voluntarily and consensually to help us solve problems and help us work together. The last thing you wanna do is elevate the people who are doing or perpetrating bad against you as the people who are allegedly going to solve these problems. It doesn't make any sense. And, and besides that, it's outright dangerous because it creates mm -hmm. a situation where corruption automatically runs rampant, which is the case in the U.S. and everywhere else that has government, democratic governments right now. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes I always say, like, if I'm going to call the cops on somebody, then I ought to be prepared for the cops to take their lives. <laughs> so do they do have a monopoly on force? If I feel like, um, you know, someone has taken my child uh, or, you know, something that, then I will call them because, but other, other things, it's so funny. It's, you can take small cases. I had a neighbor pooping, his dog pooping in my yard and he wouldn't listen to me. I tried several times to write him nice notes and say, listen, I believe in personal responsibility. I get your, he was trying the most adult way and he didn't do it. So I did call the HOA, but they don't have guns. <laughs> so it did get resolved. And I think in a private society, I mean, in the end, we're going to have like, you know, HOAs and private courts and security. And obviously, you know, the dollar speaks to that too. So, you know, if you're paying for a good and goods and services and the services suck, well, people will stop paying for them. So there's a lot of checks and balances. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to think on that grand scale of, you know, murder and, and robbery and those kind of things. But like you said, it, it, it happens and it can be achieved. We just, you know, we live in the largest, uh, we live in a country with the largest government that's ever existed. So it's, sometimes it's really hard to think about those things. It so is. we're going to get into a little bit about cryptocurrency soon, but right now we're just going to take a little ad break. So we will be right back. Well, welcome back to Ginger Archie. I am talking to Sterling Lujan. Um, he's an anarchist, uh, crypto journalist. Um, he does a lot of work in consulting with cryptocurrency. And we're going to ask him stupid Trishy questions first. And then we're going to ask him a little bit about uh, cryptocurrency and kind of circle back to his new book, which I'm excited to read. Um, so <clears throat> cryptocurrency, a lot of anarchists and libertarians are in this space. Some people might not understand how they're correlated. So why, what does anarchy have to do with cryptocurrency? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess it's going to start by me explaining kind of where, where cryptocurrency came from, so some of the origin, origins or the roots. So we'll start with Bitcoin since it's the primary uh, cryptocurrency. It's what we call the ER cryptocurrency, right? It was the first, the first mm -hmm. one. So B Bitcoin was created on the hills of the 2007 and 2008 financial collapse. And there's a reason why it was created on the heels of the financial collapse. If you read the white paper by the creator, the creator's name is Satoshi Nakamoto, and that's just a mm -hmm. pseudonym. We don't know who it is. We don't know if it's a he, mm -hmm. she, it, or alien, <laughs> right? Yeah. C completely anonymous person still to this day. So 
when when Satoshi Nakamoto wrote the white paper, which is just a scientific paper describing the technology, one of the key phrases in there is that this technology is going to be used to disintermediate trusted third parties. And now let's tie that into another piece of that. When the technology was created in the in the the vast ledger, the ledger technology that Bitcoin runs on top of, the first block had a had a text message from the creator. And that text message says, Chancellor on the brink of second bailout, right? This was around the time when the banks in the US or the government in the US was bailing out all the banks and all the corporations during the 2007, 2008 financial uh, bubble, housing collapse, et cetera. So the idea here was that there was a gigantic amount of fraud perpetrated against the American people and people all across the globe by bankers, by all of their friends, by government agencies and their control over fiat currency. So what we needed to create was a decentralized currency or a type of currency that a, an individual cannot control or a small group of individuals cannot control. As we now know, with the fiat dollar reserve system, these guys can literally press a giant red button and print out as much of this currency as they want. This is a phenomenon called hyperinflation. And some countries have been destroyed by hyperinflation. Venezuela is a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, their, their fiat currency called the Bolivar has been printed out so much that it's virtually worthless. Families might be able to use it as kindling for the fire by the bedside at best, right? So we, we don't want that to happen in the U.S., even though the government claims that FDIC insurance protects us from the yeah. government, from, from <laughs> funds being taken, seized, or hyperinflated away into oblivion. Yeah. Side note, don't you always laugh when you see that little sticker at the bank or somewhere that says, your money? <laughs> <laughs> that just makes me laugh. It's protected and insured. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely not the case. We always so at the end of the day, we want to be able to protect our own money. And that's one of the reasons why why cryptocurrency, Bitcoin specifically, was created so that we have money or an asset that we control, right? And here's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin. It's a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized technology. Peer-to-peer -peer meaning that I can send my Bitcoin to Trish without some kind of trusted third party to manage those funds on either side of the transaction. The money literally goes right to her as if I had cash and just handed it to her, except everything happens electronically. Uh, but it's also borderless. So if uh, Trish was in Japan and I'm wherever I am in the United States, I can still send the funds without having to pay a bunch of extra fees to uh, governments, their agencies, or even the, the Western unions of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. So and the cool thing about Bitcoin that really fights the ambiguities and the nastiness of the system is that there's always a certain amount amount that the protocol is ever going to put into existence. And that's 21 million units of Bitcoin by the year 2140, if memory serves. So it has scarcity built into it, which is one of the reasons that Bitcoin is upwards of forty thousand dollars. A, a unit per coin right now. It's because no one can can just arbitrarily create more of it out of thin air. So that That's it's a like, very like a precious metal protocol. or something like that. Yeah, and actually, the white paper, the the original thought behind how to create Bitcoin was modeled after literal mining of of gold. Right. So, and th this is how it happened. I'm not going to get too technical here, but this is how it happens. Effectively, these the Bitcoin is decentralized, meaning there's a bunch of miners, and these are just, uh, they're really powerful computers across the world. Now they're mostly, uh, they exist inside of mining farms, but these computers are effectively racing to solve a complex mathematical problem. And whichever one wins actually gets to not only secure a block of data on the Bitcoin network, which is just transactional data, but they also get to create a special uh, a, a special section in the block for themselves for the creation of new Bitcoin. And I, I, I forget what the exact amount is right now that's being printed out. It changes. There's a, something called a, a halving. So every four years, the amount created and put into circulation is, is effectively halved. So there's a certain reward that each uh, miner, if they win, if they solve that problem, they get that amount uh, 
you know, right now as the reward for my, for validating those blocks and also securing the network to make sure it's impervious to hackers and attackers. So it's a it's a really amazing solution against this problem of people being able to control our money and our finances. Now, of course, yeah. this is a side discussion. Go, go ahead, Trish. You're gonna I know what you're going to talk about, that capital gain. <laughs> is that what you were going to go into? I, yeah, I, I was going to get into that, but I was also going to, you know, make the suggestion that a lot of people who have gotten into the cryptocurrency space recently, uh, more or less, have dollar signs in their eyes. They're just looking at this as a speculative asset. They have forgotten the crypto anarchist and the anarchic roots of of cryptocurrency. And some people have actually tried to make the case that it wasn't really, uh, you know, the the whole purpose of Bitcoin was not. Uh, based in anarchism or freedom, just in decentralization. I honestly see the, the two ideas as coinciding. More decentralization means less centralized bureaucracies and less control. And we could get into, you know, we don't, we're not going to do this here, but we could get into the, the fir- go back a little further in history and talk about the cypherpunks who had these ideas originally in the 1990s and talk about some of the cryptographers who were crypto anarchists who helped contribute to the creation of the mathematical protocols behind Bitcoin. So all, all this stuff kind of came came together in a in a giant swirl or giant vortex of uh, philosophizing and people getting together to philosophize to, cr- to create this. Even though in the white paper, there's not a direct reference to crypto anarchism or freedom. Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that was, kept it very sim- simple, but he did men- mention the idea of not having to rely on trusted third parties or disintermediating trust, trusted mm-hmm. third parties. Well, I don't think one needs to, you know, quote Rothbard to do something that makes people more free. That <laughs> seems kind of, you know, if you're doing sure. something to decentralize the government or make people more free, then you're working as somebody moving towards anarchism. So I, I see that a lot of people argue about that stuff. And yeah, I, think I agree. Was- I think technology <laughs> in general largely tends to move toward greater freedom. That's one reason why yeah. I like the tech industry in general. Um, so what would you say to somebody uh, that's maybe new to cryptocurrency? They want to get in on the game. They're scared. They think that the government's going to, you know, come after them somehow. What, where should they go? Um, what should they read if they're just starting this new adventure? Yeah, there's a whole lot of things I, I would advise. The first thing is um, I, I, I still think Bitcoin.com and news.bitcoin.com has a lot of really valuable information and a lot of valuable resources. So I recommend checking them out, reading their sites, keeping track of the news in the space. I also recommend getting Andreas Antonopoulos's book called The Internet of Money. Andreas Antonopoulos has been a figurehead in the cryptocurrency ecosystem, and he's been in the space uh, for as long as I can remember, since the beginning days of crypto, very early days. So reading his book and listening to his lectures has been instrumental for my own learning early on when I started out in the space. And then you can actually check out our, our company's website. We facilitate crypto transactions. Uh, my shameless plug here, cryptospace.com. Uh, we have educational well, you got resources that one as early. well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so hi- I highly recommend that. And then there's, there's, one, there's one book that I think you should get – be a little bit more involved in the space before you read it and get some experience. But the Bitcoin standard is also a book that I recommend people can read. But uh, don't don't be don't shy away from doing plenty of research because there is one thing that's true of the cryptocurrency space, and it's been a haven for scammers and con artists for the longest time as well. Uh, not everything in the space is always what it seems. Uh, so the important thing is always do your own due diligence when you start researching different cryptocurrency projects, because there's more than just Bitcoin now, right? There's uh, literally thousand or more alt- alternative coins or other cryptocurrencies. Stay tuned and, for uh, Ginger Archie coin. <laughs> it's coming, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so we can't, so it's, <clears throat> we're recording this Thursday, the 20th of May. So we can't not talk about what happened the last few days. What is your diagnosis of it, if you want to say that? And then uh, what advice would you give to people that are like basically pooping their pants right now? Okay, so we're talking (laughs) about the the, the market and what's happened in the last couple of days, right? (laughs) To to people who've been in the space in the cryptocurrency ecosystem for more than four or five years, and some for some people less than that, these kind of massive market shifts and this 
for lack of a better term, volatility is completely normal. Yes, some of it is probably based on market man manipulation, but guess what? Mm -hmm. This is a hugely free market and the market is global. It doesn't sleep. Everybody can touch it if they want to touch it somehow. And because of this, the market is going to see massive flux fluctuations. And unfortunately, uh, because it's still so, we're still so new in, in this ecosystem, the industry is still so new, uh, individual celebrities still have a lot of uh, influence on what happens in the market. So when Elon Musk makes a tweet about Dogecoin, it goes up or down. Or when e Elon says that his company's Tesla is not going to accept Bitcoin for their cars anymore, it's going to have an impact on the market. And could this be these guys like Elon and Tesla, et cetera, manipulating the market behind the scenes? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not going to make that judgment call. But at the end of the day, the trend for Bitcoin and most cryptocurrencies has been up unless those cryptocurrencies have been scammed, scam coins, in which case they've been eliminated from the market, right? Mm -hmm. So this is all, this feels perfectly healthy and normal to me. There's corrections, there is some manipulation, there's, there's actors in the market who have, who are what we consider wells, who can move the market just by doing, you know, one or two transactions, high volume transactions, of course. So I, I would say don't, there's no need to freak out. The market is going to correct to where it needs to correct. And then it's likely going to continue its, its trail upward. The only thing you would need to worry about is if something fundamentally threatens Bitcoin, like if the fundamentals themselves of the cryptocurrency are threatened. And what this means is there's been, if there is some attack vector exposed that threatens the blockchain technology itself, then maybe we have cause for concern because that would actually render the technology useless, right? And the one fear that people talk about a lot in this regard is quantum computing, right? Mm -hmm. when, when what's called quantum supremacy takes hold, it's possible that there are going to be algorithms, uh, the, that one algorithm is called Shor's algorithm that can actually reverse engineer all of the algorithms that there are the cryptography that allows Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to function. That's however, really scary. however, I, yeah, I was going to, <laughs> I was going to attenuate the fear a little bit as well. There, there are different, there are different elements within Bitcoin, right? There's the blockchain itself. There's people's wallets. There's people's computers. And it's very unlikely that quantum supremacy immediately is going to create a scenario where everything just gets completely obliterated. Uh, for one, there are there are some crypto or sorry some quantum resistant algorithms built into Bitcoin, and some people still think SHA-256 is mostly quantum resistance, although that's highly debated by cryptographers and quantum professionals. But here's the thing. Even if item supremacy becomes a reality tomorrow, all these cryptocurrencies have the ability to, to fork, which is effectively reversioning the software so that they do have more quantum resistant properties built into them. So that's it, it, these, that's the beautiful thing. These cryptocurrency blockchains are highly anti-fragile. They're not easy to break or to crack. Even, even upon quantum supremacy, the actors in the space can move very quickly to help protect their blockchains and protect people in the community from hacks and from various kinds of attacks. And people since the since day one, since the creation of Bitcoin, hackers and uh, we're talking black hat hackers, white hat hackers, all these guys have been constantly trying to attack Bitcoin and it's never fallen. Yes, people have had their personal wallets hacked, but that, that all that me requires is a hacker to get into their computer. Exchanges have been hacked. All that requires is a hacker to get into their servers. But this is the, the foundational technology, blockchain technology has not been threatened yet. And I don't suspect that uh, the you know, quantum computing is going to absolutely disable or destroy the technology. We're just going to grow with quantum computing. computing. And what quantum computing actually implies is that we're going to have stronger forms of cryptography that we can actually apply to blockchain technology as well. So I'm actually optimistic about quantum computing and its implications for cryptography and for blockchain tech. So that kind of goes to my next question. It's kind of a two-pronged question. What do you see as uh, the future of cryptocurrency? Do you see people using it, which you can use it as currency now, obviously, so I could go buy something. Um, in fact, I have, and I'm buying something for my friend because she lives across a border and we can't cash app each other. So <laughs> I can send her some coins. Um, but what do you see for the future of it? And then what do you see for the future of the US dollar? 
Um, do you think we're going to ride this debt out for 50 years or do you think we're going to see a hard crash? I, I tend to – I don't agree with Peter Schiff on a lot of things, but I think he's right when he talks about we're going to see a – you know, a collapse of the dollar. There is, you can't, you can't hyperinflate the, the dollar to the extent that it has been hyperinflated and not to expect repercussions. The only reason why the dollar hasn't crashed is because it's a global reserve currency and many countries around the world use it as their primary form of currency. But guess what? If in, indeed, I think this will happen, more people start using cryptocurrency to flout having to use the USD as a global reserve currency, all those dollars come flooding back to the US. And when this happens, there is a high likelihood that we could see the, the con finally see the full consequences of hyperinflation. But we see that all the time. Anytime price rises in the grocery store, anytime the price of gas goes up or any commodity, that is a sign that we're already experiencing the effects of hyperinflation. We just haven't experienced the full effects since the dollar has been used as a global reserve currency. Here's an interesting thing that's happening with crypto. A lot of countries that are quote unquote sanctioned, like Venezuela, North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, these it, there's some evidence out there that these countries are already starting to mine Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, and they're actually using uh, blockchain technology to flout sanctions. And I that's something that terrifies the I have this picture of Kim Jong-un <laughs> like <mining> Bitcoin. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be stupid. I think, like, so what do you think is going on with China? I mean, obviously, they're trying to crack down on it, but, you know, there's a lot of people in China with computers, so what do you think Yeah, happen? this. Yeah, this conversation is can go about it can be about china and the us and some of the other major players together so a lot of these major countries these huge economic territories are absolutely terrified of cryptocurrency and bitcoin and a lot of these places can't decide how they want to tackle it regulatory wise so china has been on and off the banned bitcoin hype since er, in the early days they tried to ban mining they've tried to ban exchanges they've changed their mind they've re-implemented bans they they bureaucratized the whole space uh, they're they're constantly worried about it you know china is a more controlling communist type of nation that heavily tries to police everything that their citizens do uh, so there's a couple things possibly happening. They just haven't decided if they want to outright ban it because they also don't want to destroy their own gross domestic product and, mm -hmm. and the innovation that this technology brings. And also a lot of people in the upper echelons of that society have Bitcoin holdings. So it, they know every time that we talk about banning, the price is going to go down. So there's probably some market manipulation mixed into all of this kind of stuff as well. I think ultimately what's going to happen, and this is this – is you know, this is my hope and wish and my own idealism. Well, you're a compassionate, positive anarchist. Yeah. So I'm going to hope I, it comes true. Yeah, I, w I, want, I want cryptocurrency to completely take over. I want people, I want mass adoption to occur. I want as many people leveraging it for everyday transactions as possible. Uh, to some degree, Bitcoin makes that a bit harder because fees are so high. There's some technological limitations there. But there are other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin Cash, mm -hmm. uh, Dash to some degree, uh, some other tokens, some other cryptocurrencies that people can use as cash every single day. And I think the more people that use them, the more uh, or the less used fiat currencies are going to be. And people already realize the power that cryptocurrency has over fiat currency, right? Because now it's not the picture of a president looming over you with a gun on a dollar bill. Now it is the, you know, maybe now it's the, the Doge coin. Maybe it's Doge and the memes that have come to, to take back over society from the evil controllers. So I think it's a, I think we have a bright future ahead. It's hard to say exactly how it's going to play out, but I do think governments will continue to fight back against the, the growing scourge of cryptocurrency. And they'll either fight back by trying to, and this is one thing banks are trying to do. They're trying to create their own C, what's called CBDCs or central central banking digital currencies so that they can have their own currencies to print out and give people. But these aren't going to be like- Yeah, the but they're banks, so we, they have to follow. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and they're going to be they're going to be able to print as much as they want. They're going to be able to seize from people's wallets. This isn't something you can the do. The chase with, with... doggy coin. Come by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So, well, I just have a, a few more minutes left, but I do thank you. You really explained cryptocurrency really well because a lot of people will go off on a tangent, which is fine if you're in this space. But a lot of people are newer to it. And you helped me understand a few things. Um. But back to your book, Dignity and Decency. So, I mean, you talk a lot about how you know. Crypto can be used for freedom. Um, talk about compassionate anarchy, what the future can look like. Um, 
I think a lot of people view anarchists that are in the space, at least, um, to be somewhat brutal people. And they see it as just a cold, hard world. And I think you come at it from a diff different aspect. And I'm quite the same way. Um, I don't think you can lure anybody into uh, a movement or even to just understand it for themselves if you're going to be an asshole. And so you kind of take a bit of compassion in that way. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to get into this. Maybe we have a part two at some point. I because this yeah, is a absolutely. Big big, big I can talk for two hours to you. <laughs> yeah, this and this is a whole section. Of, this is part two of my book. It's uh, called Relational Anarchism. Uh, the the basic idea here is that we don't always have to use uh, logic, uh, moral principles, and those ideas to persuade people into anarchism, right? Because a lot of times this requires us to debate or get into arguments with people, which often cause people to ra raise their shields and, the, and then the defense mechanisms come out and then it can potentially get ugly. And you see this all the time on, on online discourse. So one of my ideas have been to leverage what's called the relationalist ethic. And that is the idea that if we can treat people as humanly as possible, if we can leverage as much compassion and try to connect with people and then talk to them about anarchism or maybe not even talk to them about anarchism, just talking, talk to them about living together in the same society. Here's the thing with, with the relation of, relation of ethic, it basically states that compassion is on the same wavelength as non-aggression. If you're being compassionate with someone and interacting with somebody in a, in a peaceful, uh, compassionate way, you're by virtue of that not being violent or aggressive toward them or leveraging coercion. So the more compassion and, and dignity and decency that we have in society, the more that we're creating a freer society and freer uh, communities to live within, right? Because it, the two aren't correlated. Compassion is not typically cor correlated with violence. If you're com being compassionate to somebody, you wouldn't, by the same token, you're moving you're the farthest away from yeah. violence. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I do want to add this very important point too. The government is just a bureaucracy Gover and, and bureaucracies are lifeless in the sense that there's no emotion attached to that. They're all about expediency, enforcing rules, and leveraging violence to meet those ends as efficiently as they possibly can, which is usually not efficient unless they're murdering people, which is yeah. typically more. So it's, it's cold and detached. There's no compassion in a bureaucracy by virtue of what it is. So it is, in my opinion, how... Uh, humankind's lack of emotional attachment and compassion to others has manifested in societal organization, right? It's just cold, detached, and lifeless and wants to force its will on everybody at large, right, without any kind of consideration as to the human element that's that's involved with that. And I talk a bit about that in the in different essays and sections of the book as well. And I think that's important to consider if we want if we have a more emotional and attuned and connected society, by virtue of that, we're not gonna have government because bureaucracies are cold, detached and emotionless. Um, I actually wanna have you back on like soon because I want to go into that. That's um, <clears throat> something I'm really passionate about too. But I'm also, you just like shook my whole world because I realized that compassionate conservatism isn't real. And all my days spent as a Republican activist have been lost. <laughs> that, do you remember <laughs> that movement? I don't know if you were ever in that space. I was a big neocon and activists for a while and there was this compassionate conservatism and it was basically like you know you know I, I, we don't want gays to get married but we're going to smile at you when you say that or whatever i don't know what whose idea that was i think it came from the uh, second bush era <laughs> but anyways um thank you so much for coming on again i want to have you back on to talk a little bit more about um anarchy compassion dignity grace and all the positive things that are happening in the movement but in the meantime where can people find you? What's what's the easiest easiest place to go? Yeah, so the first spot I would recommend going is to my website, Sterling Lujan, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-L-U-J-A-N dot com. You can actually pre-order my book on the landing page that is there. And if you want to find me on social media, I'm also easy to find. You can go to Sterling Lujan, or yeah, just Sterling Lujan on Facebook. And I'm also on the decentralized platforms like Float and mines as well i guess a quasi <laughs> centralized yeah <laughs> and i'm on twitter in the crypto space as well in the you know the crypto twitter as they call it as at at sterlin lujan okay and i'll put some of that in the show notes so thank you so much for coming on i appreciate it can't wait to talk to you again soon and i would close out this episode of gingerarchy by saying what i always do i wish you peace grace love and fuck the state
<laughs> you as well, Tris. Take care. <laughs> Thanks.